Hello, tea friends. This is Barb Gully of Barb's Tea Service, and we are on our ninth podcast. Amazing. Number nine. Number nine. Is, is it going to be naughty or will it be nice? Oh, <laughs> okay. <laughs> I think it's going to be really nice. Okay. Well, that that's all we need to know. Based on our topics yes. for today. So, Chris, hello. Hello. He is our BTS podcast co-host, Arm Candy, and studio engineer. That's what I do. Mm-hmm. <laughs> An old man about town. Yep. And this one, I'm always excited about our podcast, but this one I'm super excited about because we're talking about things that I absolutely love. I'm passionate about. Yes. And our theme is outworn is in. Mm-hmm. What what the heck is outworn? Outworn is a term that's used to describe things that are obsolete, no longer in use. Mm-hmm. And we're putting that to a few items that are outworn, mm-hmm. but can still have a a very great purpose. And I should add, as a public service announcement that uh, we're also providing uh, a really good answer to crossword uh, clues. <laughs> kind of arcane things. Yes. Okay. All right, there we go. Okay, so, it, and it's going to be about salt cellars mm-hmm. and knife rests. Yeah, a knife rest. <laughs> I know, I know. Okay. Also goes with number nine. Number nine? Knife. It's the end sound. Okay. <laughs> But first tea. All right. Okay. There we are. So today I brewed up some Arnie's Coronation Tea. And for those who are watching on yes. YouTube, mm-hmm. this is it. Yes. And I picked this for a couple reasons. Mm-hmm. One is it's the month of uh, commemorating the coronation of King Charles the Third. Mm-hmm. And Queen Consort Camilla. And Charles will, name Charles will come up later today, won't it? It will. It will. Yes. There's a little sneak preview. Yes. So (laughs) we're getting whipped into a frenzy here. It's so exciting. But so we picked it for for that purpose because it's an anniversary. I remember last May 6th, Mm -hmm. I was up about four Mm o'clock to watch all the ceremonies. Right. And where were you? Where was I? I don't think I was watching the ceremonies. I don't think so either. (laughs) But anyway, so it's been a year already. And this is a Darjeeling blend. Okay. Now, Darjeeling is is an area in India, right? It is. Yep. It is. And they picked, I think Harney picked it for a couple of reasons. One, Darjeeling is reported to be King Charles's favorite tea. Uh Uh-huh. He likes it with a little bit of honey. Nice. Yeah, and also the ties between yeah. Britain and India. Yeah. So, how do you like this tea? Well, I I like it. Um, so I um I consulted my my flavor wheel. <laughs> okay, both of them are just one. Oh, both of them. Okay, of course. Um, so it's a it's a so it's a black tea. It's lighter. Uh, def- yeah. definitely the kind of the opposite of earthy or or that sort of thing. Right. Maybe kind of um. A bit on the uh, floral, or maybe a little bit of a fruit in there, like an orange blossom, and uh, uh, maybe a, a perfume. Okay. Uh, kind of aftertaste. So that's where I'm at on this. You know, I agree with you a hundred percent on that. Yeah. I think you you nailed it. That's that the perfumey notes at the end. Yep. Yeah. Excellent. So yes, yeah, yeah. so this is a very nice nice tasting tea. Yeah. And. The other thing, the other reason I should say why I selected the coronation tea is because with the things that we're talking about today, these outmoded dinnerware, mm-hmm. tableware, and the customs of using them right. always starts with the the tap, the right. royals. Yes. Filters down aristocracy, nobility, et cetera, until it gets to the rest of us. They set the fashion. They do. They do, indeed. So, as I mentioned, we are going to t- 
talk about two of these outwares. Mm-hmm. And <laughs> that was the word, or what was it? Well, it's outworn. This is uh, yes. this is cutlery that has lost its meaning in life. Exactly. <laughs> it's looking for a home. There you go. So, uh, so with the 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 salt cellars and knife press, we'll start with what I think is probably the oldest, right? And that would be the salt cellars, right? And salt. And its value goes way back to ancient times. Right. And salt was very desirable mm-hmm. because it was a flavor enhancer. Right. And also preserved the food. Right. And so going back to ancient Rome, soldiers were paid in salt. Right. And they would be, as you say, worth their salt. Exactly. And I think that's also where the uh, uh, word salary comes from. Is that right? I think so. Wow. We'll make it right. Okay. <laughs> that makes sense, though, yeah. doesn't it? Yes. Okay. So, as we, you know, as we're getting into medieval times, salt containers mm-hmm. start showing up on the table. Right. And I should say what a salt cellar looks like. All right. So it's a little bowl. Right. I've got a couple here. All right. And just think of of your grandmother's cut glass bowls right and shrink it down but very small very small right so they would be placed on the table Mm -hmm. and it morphed into this status right thing (laughs) as many things do and where where the salt cellar was placed on the table Mm -hmm. and your proximity to it as a dinner guest right told you how you stood right so if you were near the the salt cellar Mm -hmm. or what they call above the salt yes that meant you were distinguished guests you were the hoi polloi you absolutely were yeah (laughs) so there was a salt dilemma Uh salt cellar dilemma i should say as there always is well this one (laughs) yes is this one was a a bit of a, a problem for a king. Yes. Dates 1378. Mm-hmm. Okay, so we've got a few King Charles. We do. This, so, yes. So it probably requires a little bit more concentration than most of our <laughs> goings on. But so we have King Charles the Fifth of France. Right. And he's hosting a dinner and he's hosting King Charles the Fourth. Right. Holy Roman Emperor. Which uh Historians have noted was uh, neither holy nor Roman nor an empire. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> and a little tangent: we did see a statue uh-huh. of this King Charles the Fourth, right? Holy Roman Emperor. Yep. When we were in Prague, right? Uh, this was the bridge with all of the statues on it. And, right. And the it Charles was, Bridge. Oh, was, oh, the Charles Bridge, of course. Yes. yes. Reinforces that. Right. Okay. So back to our dinner party. Yes. King Charles the Fifth of France. Yep. He's got the Holy Roman Emperor, mm-hmm. King Charles the Fourth, right, and King Wenceslas, the King of Germany. Yes, and his dilemma is where does he place the salt cellar? That is a conundrum because um, you know there's a lot of ego. Um, there's some amount of salt <laughs> right. and proximity. Yes, and uh, that's a uh, that's that's a that's a tough one. So. Um, well, that's, uh, well, how did he solve it? Okay. I do know the answer because he was in this quandary. Yeah. Do I put it in front of me? Yes. Or how do I? Yeah. You don't want to pick... insult your fellow fellow royals <laughs> exactly. and start a war. Right. <laughs> <laughs> and we've seen, <laughs> yeah. we've seen uh, yeah. uh, tensions rise over something yeah. similar. But right. what he did was he took out three salt cellars amazing one for himself and one for the other two kings yes uh well did he did 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 that exhaust his supply of salt cellars it did not (gasps) i believe he had almost over 40 so he could have had a lot more kings he was (laughs) he was kind of holding back huh okay (laughs) okay so that was very much like a king solomon solution yep and just a note 
that when um, when the colonists came over to New England, they continued this practice right. of where the salt was placed and how that distinguished you yep. as a guest. Mm-hmm. So if you're above the salt, yep. you're an honored guest. Mm-hmm. If you're below the salt, you're with the children yeah. or you're just yep. a nobody. <laughs> Kind of like at Thanksgiving, there's the children's table and the adults table. Exactly. Okay. Exactly. All right. Some things just don't end. No, no, that's right. So, uh, salt cellars though started to fall out. They they did get more prominence in the Victorian times because mm-hmm. we see more is more. Right. The more things you had on the table, the more it showed your wealth. Mm-hmm. And when we get to the beginning of the 1900s, right. They start falling out of flavor, favor, well. Air. Or flavor, yeah. <laughs> because in 1912, an anti-caking agent right. is made, and we can use a salt shaker with no problem. Yes. I love technology in, the modern, <laughs> in our modern days. <laughs> Isn't that amazing? Yeah. So, So now we don't see them for salt. However, mm-hmm. we, we are going to talk towards the end about how we repurpose them yes. because we love them and collect them. Well, I collect them. Yes. <laughs> you might love them a little less. Yeah. Okay. So knife rust. Okay. Here we go. So Chris, do you recall when we sort of, I reentered the world of knife rust, but where we first became acquainted or reacquainted with the knife rust? Where, where we actually saw one in the wild. <laughs> Right? <laughs> in use. Yes. Uh, so it was one of our, uh, one of our trips uh, with, uh, with your brother and your sister-in-law, and uh, I think we're doing a little uh, uh, snowboarding in Myrtle Beach, and yeah. uh, we stopped off in, was that West Virginia? It was West Virginia. And at a place called Trinkle Mansion. Yes. A lovely place. Lovely place. So, yeah, Ed found this place, and it was a real treasure it was beautiful it was a and b it was a and b so we stayed overnight and uh i will say unfortunately it's no longer right uh in business but it was beautiful chandeliers right. and everything and then the proprietress uh actually talked about how she hand dusted uh this um, incredibly ornate chandelier and uh and I should mention she was kind of walking around with a cane at the time. I right, think she had, right, right. had hip problems or something yes. like that. It's like, how on earth are you doing this? Right. Because there was more than one chandelier. Oh, yeah, yeah. They were all over the place. Yeah. And uh, we asked how long it took her to do one, yeah. and, and she wouldn't say. Yeah, right. So we yeah. know it was a long time. <laughs> and, uh, yeah, that, that was rather right. daunting task. Right, right. But for the knife rests, mm-hmm. she had knife rests on our breakfast table in the morning Mm -hmm. and she was using them to hold teaspoons for those of us who were having coffee or tea right you could you're adding a little milk yep and you could set your your spoon on the knife rest and keeping it off the coffee table exactly off the or off the uh, the table the tablecloth thank you (laughs) whatever that thing is (laughs) whatever you're gonna put it yeah so i'm gonna show this to the camera yep but if you're just listening, it's the think, shape of a think of a of a uh, a dumbbell for hamsters. <laughs> yes, that would be even <laughs> big for them. But right, it's it looks it's in a like a a barbell, barbell shape. shape. Yeah. Uh-huh. And this one in particular is crystal. Uh huh. And so they just rest on your table, right. and then your knife yep. rests like this. Okay. Or a teaspoon. A, a teaspoon, right? Yep. So, going back to the Trinkle Mansion. When I saw these on the table, I went back 50 years, probably over, yeah, over 50 years yes. to a childhood memory. Mm-hmm. And when I first encountered knife rests, and I remember I regaled the group yes. at the breakfast table. And right. I think your exact words were, oh, she's starting again. <laughs> <laughs> Here we go. Here we go. But, so, what happened was 12 years old in junior high, Mm -hmm. and, uh, you know, this group of uh, friends that I had, we would do slumber parties, and 
Julie mm-hmm. had uh, Julie Pierce. She had a slumber party at her home, mm-hmm. and it was in Bloomfield Hills. Uh-huh. It was up on a hill, yep. mid-century. Mm-hmm. But I don't think we called it that back then Be- because we were mid-century. <laughs> we are mid-century, right? So there's a group of us, and we are in their living room, which is adjacent to their dining room. Mm-hmm. And we're rolling out our sleeping bags, and we're talking about uh, whatever. And we cute boys, right? Uh, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> and I fulfilled my destiny. <laughs> so we uh, we're looking up in the dining room, and on the wall, her parents had a bunch of these shadow boxes mm-hmm. with this item yep. that we didn't know what it was. Yes, and they were mostly crystal. Uh-huh. At the time, we didn't know what it was, but it was beautiful, yeah. and they were in this, like, encased in black velvet as a background right. and really pretty, but none of us knew what it was, so we're just going, oh, that's so pretty, and yeah. and so one of the uh, the uh, the friends of ours who, who was most um, least concerned about yeah. what people thought about her, <laughs> she said, what are those? Yeah. So Julie proceeded to tell us that they were knife rests and that her parents collected it. Uh-huh. So that was my first encounter. Okay, so fast forward to 2021. Yep. We go to the Trinkle Mansion. There it is. And there they are. And I fell in love with them all over again. So I wanted to learn more. Mm-hmm. So <laughs> I went to look for a book on knife rest. Mm-hmm. And would you believe I actually found, I only, I found one. Yes. Is that shocking? Uh, I can't believe you even found one. <laughs> That's all I could find was this one. And I'll put this up again here. Yep. Uh-huh. So this book was written in 2003 uh-huh. by Dean Rockwell. And he's a local. He's a Michigan resident. Mm-hmm. Well, he was. Uh, he passed away, I think, two years after the book was published. But he lived to, he was 95, 93 when he wrote the book. Yeah. And... It's an autograph copy because I think it's out of print, mm-hmm. and it's to Joe and Gloria. Somebody, but, <laughs> but it's signed from Dean. Yeah, and this book held two amazing surprises for me. Yes, I was shocked. Yes, first one in the acknowledgments. So Dean was a collector from 1968 going forward, mm-hmm. and he went to a lot of museums and a lot of libraries in search of information on knife rests and, mm-hmm. and, and he didn't find a lot right. believe it or not but anyway he in his acknowledgement section he talks about all the that he's taking all the libraries mm-hmm. all the museums who mm-hmm. helped him and at the end he acknowledges his thanks to mr pierce amazing of, of bloomfield hills for sharing his research and notes full circle for knife rests how did I know? 12 years old, yeah. I'm in the yeah. home of somebody who's a renowned expert on knife press. <laughs> wow. I know. <laughs> okay, I'll, I'll hold the applause. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> <laughs> the second surprise was in the chapter that's called Porcelain Knife Rest. Yes. There is a picture of a knife rest. Mm-hmm. And it's very rare. Uh-huh. It is a, a pair of ceramic knife rests. And the reason they're rare is because it's the only pair in the U.S. that can be traced to a single manufacturer. Mm-hmm. And when I saw this picture and where it's located, it was incredible. It's in the Brooklyn Museum. Yes, that's right. And it just so happened that that, that year, mm-hmm. we had planned a trip to Brooklyn, to New York. Right. Our son's friend was getting married. Right. We were kindly invited. Yes, we were. It was really fun. Yeah. Um, and I don't recall any knife rests at the no. 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 Okay. But it was in the Brooklyn Museum. We were staying right. very close to the Brooklyn Museum. Yep. Made a little side trip. So we made a little side trip to see these. Mm-hmm. And I was a little worried because I thought when... We went there, you know, maybe they didn't have them or maybe they wouldn't know what I was talking about. I go right up to the help desk and I said, 
I'm looking for these porcelain knife rests. And they, she, the the young lady behind the, the glass was on it. She was. She said, oh, they're a pair, correct? Yeah. I said, yes. <laughs> she didn't even, yeah. like, flinch. Yeah. So we found out that it was on the upper floor. Right. What was that? It was the... Uh, uh, well, it was their store. It was kind of their miscellaneous storage area for things that weren't on active display. But but people, it was open to the public. So you kind of go through a door and and and, and it's uh, kind of referred to it as your grandmother's attic, I guess. Right. Uh, and there's just all kinds of different stuff. But yeah, sure enough, they there was a... Uh, a locator for a certain cabinet, and we made it made a beeline, and there we were. Right, and and uh, I did take a a live video. Yeah, I think it's still on my YouTube channel. All right. If not, I'll I'll post it up there. But do you remember just that moment of seeing those behind I, the glass? I was a gog. <laughs> I was too. It was really cool. Yeah. Plus, it got us to that museum, which is like you said, it's incredible. They have all kinds of interesting thing. So mm -hmm. we, we had a lot of fun. There. Yep. Okay. So while we're talking about utensils, might be uh, interesting to just talk about how utensils evolve. Yes. Because we take them for granted, yep. right? Mm -hmm. But a lot of what we use are just as commonplace. Right. Just a couple hundred years old. Fairly recent. Right. So up until Georgian times in England, mm -hmm. which I'm going to say is about um, 1760 to 1830. That's, right. that, that is right. the right time, for right. not approximately. But that's when utensils really came into use. So your knife, fork, and spoon. Right. In, in forms that we would recognize. Exactly. Exactly. So in Georgian times, we have a growing upper middle class. Mm hmm and people are entertaining. Mm -hmm. Going to a dinner party was the thing. Right. That was the highlight. Yep. And so people put a lot into their entertaining and mm -hmm. going. Right. Previous to this time, people would bring their own utensils. Mm -hmm. But now, again, got a little bit more money, a little more emphasis on fancy entertaining. Yep. Your guest is going to have all those utensils. And so you don't have to bring your own. Exactly. Can you imagine today bringing your own knife and fork? That would be that would uh, be kind of rude, wouldn't it? <laughs> <laughs> yes, <laughs> it would be. No. Okay, so with this, and we often talk about, oh well, how did etiquette come about, or right. what was the purpose of etiquette right. in, in modern times? It's really just to make sure we're all feeling confident about how we do things right. and, and to be gracious, right? But with the the onset of dining together right and being all at the table and using your fancy stuff mm -hmm. it was required to have some decorum yes manners were set in in place right to eliminate violence at the table uh-huh <laughs> okay <laughs> so right so i guess back in the day you know if you're a little unhappy you might just yeah yeah with your own knife with that your, you brought. Your own knife. Yeah. <laughs> well, so here is the, the agreed upon yep. societal norms. We're all going to behave. Yes. We all know that sometimes that's still. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Remember Thanksgiving with your yeah, family. That's right. <laughs> so. And they put me at the kids table again. <laughs> you were below the salt. Yeah. So, so here we have uh, the, the combination of, of dining yep. etiquette, manners, mm -hmm. and the knife and fork. Right. And so that's also when the knife rest would have been in place, too. Yeah. yeah to keep them out. Yeah, you know, people didn't have laundry. You know, laundry service was somebody, some person washing your stuff. Exactly. Exactly. So they had this... Uh, your, your nice linen tablecloth, if you put your used, yep. your spent knife or yep. whatever, it would soil it. And so this was where all this stuff comes in. Right. And then, as we said, now, as, as we're getting towards the end of the 1800s, early mm -hmm. 1900s, 
the knife rest also meets the fate of the salt cellar. Right. Because you got a washing machine. <laughs> right. <laughs> right. A couple of things. Yeah. With these modern conveniences yeah. coming on board, you have washing machine, dishwasher, right, right. Um, the opportunity to buy and replace things a lot easier. Right. Plus, you know, the in that time period with World War One, et cetera, people had opportunities outside of being a servant or right. yeah. household staff. There sure. are other opportunities. And also, there was less emphasis on all this fancy entertaining. Right. So not so much a need for it. Yep. But uh, it doesn't mean it's over for these these uh, outdated Right. They're still items. there. They're in, your, they're in somebody's cabinet, and we got to do something with it. Exactly, exactly. So for the salt sellers... Mm-hmm. What I learned on one of the Tea Time right. uh, online courses is that you can use these t- for your tea table, your mm-hmm. afternoon tea table. Yep. Take your little little small bowl, yep. and you could put your lemon curd or clotted cream. Yep. And, and serve it elegantly. Serve it elegantly, and everybody can have their own. Yes. Much like the kings uh-huh. did have their own salt cellar. Right. So you're going to have your own for your lemon curd. And I have a, a, a few... Mm -hmm. different sizes but since i love lemon curd and clotted cream i'm always going for the bigger one right and as we saw with the the knife rest they can be repurposed and used for Mm -hmm. the teaspoon right okay very good and one last thing uh can you think of any other of these outworn well there was uh there i think uh in our travels um like there's a a piece of of, uh, cutlery called a fish knife Yes. Which, you know, seems oddly specific. <laughs> Fish knife and fork. Yes. And we came on that in the Lake District. Yes. Yes. What was the name of that bed and breakfast? Uh, oh, boy. Uh, was that the one in uh, Castleton? Or? No, it no. was in 2018. Oh, okay. That, the real. Oh, Lake. oh, uh, yeah. Shoot. You'll uh, remember. Yeah. So, uh, uh, Windermere. Yes. Um, I can't remember. Yes. Yeah. So we were in, in Windermere, and they had a fish knife and fork. We ordered fish. Right. I was really excited. Yeah. And this was real popular in Victorian times uh-huh. because, again, more is more. And uh, it's also fully defined yes. in Barb's Tea Services Etiquette yeah. and Dining, uh, Afternoon Tea and Etiquette yep. Dining. So yep. for uh, those who want to know more about the fish knife, it's in there. Yep. And... Do I hear that certain sound? I think you do. Here we go. <laughs> All right. That, that's a sound that never gets outworn, does it? Uh, it better not. <laughs> All right. Well. Thank you all for listening slash watching. Thanks yep. to On TV Studios for letting us be here. Yes. Thanks to my special co-host and knife rest and salt seller guy. Uh, tolerant (laughs) (laughs) and as always uh just a reminder we're on youtube barb's tea service check out our blog and thank you for staying tuned excellent okay